the time to tell of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadows. Time to tell strange tales of fantasy and the supernatural. Mystery Theater presents The Ghost Town Hermit by Alan King. I went up to Colville that summer to get material for some feature articles on British Columbia ghost towns. You've heard of those dead mining towns in the northern part of the province. I found a story there, but I never wrote it. I have a certain reputation on a Vancouver paper I work on, and I wanted to keep it. I'd been ill the winter before, and Frank Strait, my editor, was being very nice about it. You could do with a series of articles for the magazine section on ghost towns. Why don't you and Lois take a month up there? Six weeks, if you like. You need a holiday, and... I need a series of features. I'd like to, Frank, but oh, I'm all right, you know. A couple of weeks would be all right. Nonsense, Ken. You look like the back end of a hard winter. You're going to take a long holiday and write me some stories. And build yourself up. Give me the willies just looking at you. Okay, Frank. I'll go. Lois will be tickled, I know. Uh, is there anything special you have in mind? Oh, no. Get into some of the lesser known towns. Barkerville's been done to death. Try some of the others. Colville, for instance. Murder there once. One of two brothers. Other one stayed on. Permit. You know whether he's still there. Where is the place? Up near Burridge, I think. You'll find it. Maybe nothing in the story, and the place may have disappeared by now. I'll go and see anyway. Sure. But leave whenever you want to, Ken, and don't come back till you look more human. Frank was right about Colville. In the gold rush days, there'd been a murder there. And though the murderer was never caught, there seemed to be a certain Bella Sawyer mixed up in it, too. She was a girl in a traveling stage show, apparently. Made a tour of those boom towns every few months. And it certainly looked promising, and we decided to make Colville our first point of investigation. We drove leisurely. I was recuperating fast and wanted to loaf a bit. It was nearly a week before we turned into Bridge. Where I thought I'd better try fishing for information about Colville. I got most bites from Sam Bryden, who ran the general store. 25 miles north of here, Mr. Bly. It's a ghost town. The real thing. Hmm? Yeah, I've been up there once. Just like you see in the movies. One street, buildings falling apart. False fronts are still there. Some of them. Saloons, banks, the Opry House. Opera House? Yes, ma'am. All them ghost towns have their opera houses. Well, it's not much, you know. They call them opera houses, though. Right. Stage shows used to come around in those days. Did you ever hear of a girl called Bella Sawyer? Uh, I don't recall. She was in one of those shows, I believe. Well, old Danny, you know. Danny? Who's he? The only inhabitant of Colville. You mean there's still somebody living there? Sure. Mm -hmm. Danny Quayle. Well, what does he do? I mean, how does he live? Just gets along, I guess. Kind of... Peculiar, you might say. Comes down here about once in two months, buys some supplies. How does he pay for them? Gold. Pans enough to buy what he needs. Been there ever since the gold rush days. I wonder why he stayed on. Well, you never asked him. His brother was uh, murdered there, you know. Marty Quayle. About 50 years ago it was. I've heard the story two or three different ways. Some say it was... Right now... Did you say Bella Sawyer? Yes. That was the name. I remember them telling me when I first came here. I have been here only about 15 years. They said this Marty Quayle was kind of stuck on this girl, Sally, uh, Bella Sawyer. And he was murdered. Didn't they catch the murderer? Ever? Nope. Some figured it was one fellow, some figured it was another. Mm -hmm. A lot of people got themselves killed in them days. Folks wasn't too particular. Well, now I think of it. Some of them thought maybe Danny Quayle killed his brother. Killed his brother? Yeah. Well, he wouldn't have stayed on, surely, if he did. Mm, he wouldn't think so. What does Danny talk about when he comes down for supplies? Oh, usually don't talk about nothing at all. Once in a while, he goes on about making a strike, stuff like that. Uh, I don't pay no attention. All them old sourdoughs talk like that. Yes, I know. Yeah. The one thing I've never been able to figure out, though. What's that? Candles. Always buys candles. But he wants to have a light, I suppose. Well, what's so strange about that? No. 
Got an oil lamp in his cap, and I know that. Because he buys oil. There's a lot of candles. Five a dozen, in fact. Oh, a history agent, fact. Yeah. I got uh, kind of curious one day, and I asked him. What did he say? He said, and I remember his very words, he said, you wouldn't want her to sing in the dark, would you? Her? Huh. What did he mean? Now, search me, ma'am. He wouldn't say no more. I never asked him again. I picked up one or two more scraps of information, but it was hard. Nobody was left alive in Burridge who remembered those days over 50 years ago when the gold fever was at its height. There were some who had heard stories, though. I learned a little about the Quayle brothers. They were totally unlike. Marty, the murdered one. Dark, good-looking, had a way with women, they said. Danny, plodding, slow-talking, hard-working. I guess Danny did most of the work on the brothers' claim. And there were hints of a flashing romance between Marty and Bella Sawyer. And then Marty was strangled, and Bella never came back to Colville. Strangled. That puzzled me. In those violent days, men killed with a knife or a gun. Strangling wasn't in the picture. Now there was nothing more that I could get in Burridge, and so we bought some supplies and headed north for Colville. <laughs> Sam said. Like a movie set. The silence. Can't believe there's anything alive here. There are no birds even. It's like a town that's waiting for the end of the world. I don't like it very much. There's nothing to be afraid of, dear. The dead can't hurt you. There's something out of character. Out of balance. I don't know what it is. What do you mean? It's hot. It's funny. Lovely summer day, and yet something cold and dead about all this. Well, it's hot, certainly. You want to walk along and have a look at things? All right. Look at the fronts of these buildings. Yes. Yeah. Trying to be impressive. Nothing behind them. Hey, what was this? Can you tell? There's something left of a name up there. Look. O, O, A, <laughs> saloon. Oh, yeah. There'll be plenty of those. And there's the bank next door. You see it? I wonder if they've forgotten that's the money in there. You want to go in and see? Oh, not me. Probably fall through the floor. If there's a floor left. Mm. Oh, Ken, look. What? Over there, the opera house. By George, so it is. The Bella Sawyer used to come and sing. Did you notice something about it? Notice what? Well, it looks taken care of. Oh, no. It's pretty dilapidated to me. I know, but the letters and the name are much clearer than any others in the street. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Almost as if someone had... Come on. Let's go over and have a look. All right. Bad shape after all. Oh, but look at the name. Somebody has tried to do something with it. Uh huh. It's been painted since uh, well, long after anything else around here was painted. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a look inside. Come on. Mm hmm. Just as I thought. Oh. Pretty well gone. A few benches, you see. Well bought. Look at the cobwebs. Look at how thick they are. What's that? What? Over there. Scrap of an old poster. Look, Liz. Oh, yes. Badly torn. Mm. It is better. Celebrated and beautiful. This. Oh, damn it. It'd be torn there. Do you think it was Bella Sawyer? I don't know. It all depends on... Oh. 
It wasn't far off, but I never came back. There was a sudden scream made my heart pound against my ribs. We whirled around from the poster holding on to each other. And they're in front of us. No doubt about it. There's Danny Quayle. He was an old, old man. His eyes pale blue, his face seamed and weathered, his hair and beard a streaky white, all straggling. There was something in his head that had once been a hat. His clothes were just a covering, patched till they had no shape or resemblance to what they had been. What he wore on his feet told us why we'd failed to hear him approach. For instead of shoes, his feet were wrapped in old cloth and sacking. He stood there, apparently not very surprised. One hand held half raised to point the torn poster. No one ever came back. These players not till till that other time. You uh you're Danny Quayle? Eh? Yeah. I say you must be Danny Quayle. Yeah. You strangers in town, ain't you? That's right. You know? I just came up to Colville to uh, uh to look around. Mm. Trying to get her fixed up. Get what fixed up, sir? Hopper horse. Have to do it myself. Nobody else will give me a hand. But you live here all alone, don't you? There's nobody to help you. I ain't alone. No, sir. Not alone. Not alone. Easy. It's all right, Lois. It's all right, When you know. Danny. Yeah? Danny, uh... We'd like to talk to you. We want you to tell us something about Colville. The old days, you know. Eh? Huh? Could we, uh, go up to your cabin? Where are you? What are you looking for? It's all right, Danny. We just want you to tell us some stories about the old days when you were prospecting here. You stay away from my cabin. Well, all right. We won't go there, then. I'll tell you what. You come along to our car. We got something to eat there. Maybe you'd like a drink. How about it? He came, finally. He ate greedily and drank a little. We tried to draw him out, but his mind wandered. Patiently, I tried to work the conversation around to Marty and Bella Sawyer. He was very wary. I could tell that years ago he'd been severely questioned about the murder. I told him they were satisfied. Marty's dead. Good and dead. Didn't do no good. She came back one night. I was there. She came back looking for Marty. Every year she came back looking for him. She never found him. Tell us, sir. Tell us about that other night. The night your brother was killed. Strangled. He was strangled. They found him outside the upper house. She's seen him lying there. She's seen him. She's seen him. Oh. Sorry, Rose. What happened before that, Danny? Huh? Did something happen in the opera house? He was sitting beside me. She was singing. He got up, started singing too. Singing with her. He was singing with her. Now, he won't be singing with her tonight. He won't be there. He won't be there. Tonight. Oh, I gotta go. I gotta get things ready for her. For her? You mean she's... She don't want nobody else to do it, just me. Gotta light the candles. She can't see without the candles. Gotta get things ready. She can't see without candles. Can't see without candles. Oh, Ken. I'm scared. There's nothing to be scared of, Don. He's armless. Just the way he talks. He believes Della Sawyer's coming here tonight. Of course he does. He was in love with her. You can see that. He just cracked. That's all. He believes that she comes back from time to time. What was all that about candles? Huh. I'm just beginning to get an idea. Yeah. And tell you what. Let's just take it easy for a while. As long as it gets dark... I think we're going to find out what the old boy's up to. Oh, I don't want to be here in the dark. No. And there's not a thing to be afraid of. There's no one else but Danny here. 
And he can't hurt you. I know he can't, but... But what, darling? It feels as if... As if there was somebody out here. We could see old Danny Quayle shuffling down the street, going noiselessly on his old rags. There was nobody else in Colville but him and the two of us. Nobody else. Lois was a brave girl that night. Her will would have taken her back to Burridge, but still she came with me down the street towards the opera house. Neither of us spoke as we slipped tensely past the dead buildings with their distorted shadows. We were within twenty paces of the opera house when Lois froze in her tracks and seized my arm with both hands. Ken, look. There's a light. A light? Where? There, look. Can't you see it? Good Lord, so there is. It's in the opera house. What can it be? It seems to be shining through a crack. Come on, let's find out. But Ken, it's all right. It'll only be old Danny. Now, come on. Don't make a noise. And watch the boards. On tiptoe, we hurried to the door of the old theater, pushed aside the burlap at the door, and peered in. What we saw stopped us as if we'd been struck by lightning. Across the front of the old broken down stage were footlights. They looked like tins cut in half to make reflectors. Set in each one of them was a lighted candle. And seated on an old bench in what was once the front row was Danny Quayle. It's Danny. Yes. I suspected something like this when he said he had to get things ready. Well, that's what he wanted the candles for. Footlights. I imagine he sees her in his mind. Uh, he was in love with her, you see. He had to make her come back. Oh, man. Oh, I don't know about that, darling. There's something else we don't know yet. Something I'd better find out. What's he doing? He's plotting. What do you know? This is the moment he sees her. Watch. that night long ago. Bella Sawyer, sweeping onto the stage, perhaps in a trailing summer frock, carrying a parasol. The miners clapping and shouting. Two brothers sitting down front. In the eyes of one, a look of mute appeal, a lost look. In the eyes of the other, a flashing, mocking recognition of the bold smile of the woman who sang. And then, without warning, leaping to his feet, vaulting into the footlights onto the stage, and arm in arm with Bella Sawyer, joining her in a chorus of the heat of the day. In a word exchange, perhaps, under the cover of the shouts and applause, and then the young man, flushed and triumphant, shaking his locked hands at the audience in a token of success, and jumping down again to the floor, falling back into his seat, telling his brother exultantly, I'm going away with her tonight after the show, and the brother mute. And then... Across the stage. 
away from whatever it is. He's trying to ward something off. He's... Uh, no. Oh, don't fall off. Leave me alone. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I killed him. I killed your Marty. I killed my own brother. He was going away with you last night. I loved you, Bella. He was no good. He'd have left you. I was the one that loved you, Bella. I, I strangled him. Killed him with my own hands. Had to do it that way. Had to show him with my own hands. My own strength. Bella. Oh, no. No, get away from me, John. What's he doing with his hands? Oh. He's to his He's fighting something off. Lois, come on. Come on, we've got to help him. No, 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 no. He rushed down to the stage, stripping over old pieces of lumber and boxes, finally reaching the footlights and climbing up around the end of it. As we got there, Danny was lying on the floor, a horrible gurgle issuing from his throat, his hands beneath his chin, twitching convulsively. We rushed over to him. I tried to tear his hands away, but I couldn't move them. And then... <laughs> He's dead, Louis. He's dead. Lois. Lois, what is it? The stage was an inch thick with ancient dust. But from the wings on the far side to where Danny had died, there was a narrow path as clean as though it had been swept. As clean as though a trailing summer fog had brushed along. We had no thought for anything but escape. Somehow we scrambled down from the stage, leaving Danny clear where he was, and tore blindly for the exit. In our haste, we were a moment or two finding the doorway. But in that moment, and the air was sultry and still, in that moment, an eddy of deathly cold air brushed past us, lingering on our faces and our hands. And as we held our breath, the torn burlap in the entrance swung gently out and back as if someone had gone out from that place. It was morning before I returned to Colville, this time with the sergeant of the provincial police and a doctor. I told the sergeant I'd solved a 50-year-old murder for him, but he was little interested in that. Like the doctor, he was interested in something else entirely. You say the old man was on his knees as if something was bearing down on him. Is that right, Mr. Bly? Yes, doctor. Hmm. A delusion, of course. He wasn't right in his head. Everyone knew that. And uh, you say his hands were up around his throat? Yes. Very curious. Take a look at this throat, Mr. Bly. Look at the marks. That man's been strangled. That's what it sounded like last night. As if you were being strangled. Exactly. But in all my experience, sir, I've never before known a man to strangle himself. I had nothing to say. Let him think that. There were things I remembered. Things I would never forget. The cold eddy of air that brushed past us. The narrow path through the dust on the rotting stage. The shadowy figure of a woman in old-fashioned summer frock that Lois saw crossing the stage. I wish I could convince her that it was a shadow thrown up by the guttering candles and the footlights embellished by her imagination. I wish I could convince myself. Theater 1030 has presented The Ghost Town Hermit, the first in a brief series of ghost stories and tales of the supernatural. The script was by Alan King. And the story was presented with John Scott as Ken, Peg Dixon as Lois, and Eric Clavering as Old Danny. Alfred Gallagher was heard as Frank, the newspaper editor. Douglas Master as Sam, the storekeeper. 
and Hugh Watson as the doctor. Sound effects were by Alex Sheridan. Technical operation, Ross Cotton. This is Bill Lorne speaking. Thank <laughs> you.